February is Black History Month, and Boise has a true gem that's telling the story of African Americans in Idaho. From former slave Alvina Moulton, who walked to Boise from Missouri in the 1860s, to Pocatello's early days as a melting pot, to the Klan's presence here, to the amazing scholars, musicians, athletes, and leaders making history into the modern era. Along the way, Idaho seems to always have been ahead of its time on civil rights, even desegregating schools a century before the South. Let's take a trip back through time on a present day tour at the Idaho Black History Museum, ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to this special Black History Month edition of Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Today we are focusing solely on that. We start with a little history on Black History Month itself. Historian Carter G. Woodson and Minister Jesse E. Moreland founded what would become Black History Month. It actually first began as Negro History Week in 1926. They chose February because it was the birth month of both Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln. A large statue of Abraham Lincoln sits in Boise's Julia Davis Park. Just a few steps away from it is the Idaho Black History Museum. It's housed in the former St. Paul Baptist Church. It tells the story of African Americans in Idaho from the 1860s to the present day. I recently got to hear a large part of that story from a man whose family has been here since the very early days. Philip Thompson is a sixth generation Idahoan and the board president and executive director of the museum, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. He told me about the beautiful building, the history it holds, and the connections it aims to inspire. Philip, tell me a little bit about this beautiful building that houses the Idaho Black History Museum. That's pretty cool. It's the first black church in the state of Idaho. It was actually built by my great-great-grandfather and great-great-great-grandfather and was moved to this location in 1998. We opened our doors in 1999. It used to be a physically located when it was a church on the uh, corner of Broadway and um, Warm Springs. Who is Alvina Moulton? Alvina Moulton was the uh, first black person to arrive in Boise, Idaho. She's actually a former slave. Um, she was freed sometime before she arrived here, and she walked from Missouri to uh, Boise, Idaho. She helped found the first Presbyterian church. Uh, she was not a member of St. Paul, but uh, of course the black community was so small, my great-grandmother knew of her and spoke of her as a viney. What's the impression that you would like people to get when they first walk in the door? First thing is just to kind of be willing to let their preconceived notions of what Idaho history and Idaho black history have to do with each other, let it all go. Because somehow we've, we've got this narrative that Idaho is somehow synonymous with Alabama, when everything about Idaho has history is actually contrary to that, but they gotta be willing to listen. It's like, like what? So I mean, you think about it, first and foremost, Idaho passed a civil rights law three years before the feds. Um, Idaho is one of seven states that had lynchings, but never a lynching of a black person. Um, Idaho, more importantly, and more, most, uh, most um, impressively, integrated public schools in 1871. And this is only six years after they passed exclusionary laws in 1865. So in order to kind of wrap your head around that, the vast majority of the country didn't integrate schools until 100 years later. And these are all things that are kind of counterintuitive when you think of Idaho. And so you have to be willing to let whatever you thought you know go. So you mentioned the exclusionary laws. 1865 reversed pretty quickly, it sounds like. Overall, was Idaho fairly welcoming to black people? I, I, would, I would probably use the word welcoming in the sense that there are so few of us that we're not at a critical mass to be viewed as a threat. Blacks have been in Idaho territory, Idaho state, the Idaho region since its inception. They've come here as farmers, as miners, as traders, etc. They've always been here. So even when they had those exclusionary laws passed in 1865, that was a direct result of the Emancipation Proclamation trying to keep you know, fewer from coming. There were blacks already here and they didn't force them out like they did the Japanese when they forced them out when they became a third of the population. So there's always been a black presence in what we know as Idaho. And what, why did the first blacks come here? Um, first and foremost, as any other group, economic opportunity. Idaho has, has always been resource rich. So when you have resources, you have to be able to take advantage of those resources. So there's a, a needed labor staff, whether it be um, mining, whether it be fur trapping, whether it be, whether it be farming. Idaho has always been a place that was conducive to, if you're willing to work and work hard, come here and make it happen. 
Um, your family has a, a rich, deep history. How many generations? Um, the seventh generation is my, uh, my daughter. She was born about nine years ago. We came here originally in 1905. One half came as farmers. They were out in Caldwell, Napa area. They came via homesteading. They were awarded you know, land to come and um, homestead. Um, the other side of my family came to Boise and they founded the first black church in the state of Idaho. So we've been here forever and that's kind of a, a microcosm of why people come to Idaho. It may be like a, a freeing religious persecution, oldest synagogue west of the Mississippi is in Boise, Idaho. Mormon population came to Idaho for the same reason. My family came to start a church. Um, or agriculture. Family came out to um, Caldwell, farming to look at take advantage and make an opportunity for themselves. And what church did your family start? Uh, St. Paul Baptist Church. Where we are right now. Where we are today. It's incredible to still have this in the family but also for everybody. Absolutely. And one of the really impressive things here is when you, when you look up on the wall above the door, you have this incredible mural. Can you tell me about this? Absolutely, this is called From Slave to President. Uh, Pablo Rodriguez, want to give props to him, he lives in Meridian. He actually um, did this for us um, just by his own free will, asked could he do something to donate it, we said absolutely. It was to commemorate the election of the first African American president. And then he instead went with like a anthology kind of telling the history of blacks in America on the bottom left, starting with the slave ship, when, which is how we arrived. And then uh, progressing through the abolitionists, civil rights era, um, Rosa Parks, um, the March on Montgomery, of course, Martin Luther King, and then culminating with the election of our first uh, black president. Now, you turn the clock back a little bit more and you have some items right over here that aren't in any way flattering for an African American, correct? Or am I, am I reading it incorrectly? <laughs> Absolutely, but they're like a necessary evil. A lot of people have given me a bit of um, pushback, especially like with the Klan robe and the caricatures of uh, black America, about why well, I can't see how you have that in here, or how you're not offended by that. And my whole point is it's part of our history. We can't whitewash it and pretend like it didn't exist because more importantly to our children, it makes it much more realistic for them to see the depths that people went to to oppress a given people, whether it were caricatures done in jest to make somebody look less human. Are these like salt and pepper shakers? And salt and pepper. This was an actual restaurant in the Northwest, the Coon Chicken Inn. Um, the Blacks and Watermelon, which is actually a trope because watermelon was actually used once upon a time to enrich blacks. And so it was seen as a threat to the economic system. And so what they did is they flipped it around and made it a caricature to make fun of black people. And so it was used that you know, you saw black people depicted with eating watermelon, what was actually an avenue of um, economic freedom once upon a time, but they didn't turn it on its head. And this was out of Silver City, Idaho. And so the Klan was in Idaho as well. Granted, we don't have any um, history of lynchings in Idaho, lynching of black people, but the Klan were here. And the funny thing about the Klan in Idaho, they were much more concerned with being anti non-Western European because the black population was so small it was anti-Greek, anti-Italian, anti-Catholic, but they still had a presence. This knife we got from a gentleman in Boise who his um, family member died and he had no idea. But he didn't want it in his house, but he thought it could do some good. He contacted us, donated the knife. So Philip, you have this series of panels here. What story do they tell? Uh, it's, the, it's called the Invisible Idahoan. It's the often um, missed narrative of Black's journey in Idaho, starting with York who came with um, Lewis and Clark, first black person to set foot in what is today known as Idaho. And then it goes, progresses through history. It goes through about 2006, and it's kind of like the story of like, you know, blacks came through for, for, through economic opportunity, opportunity, mining, et cetera. Some of the issues they face when doing so, exclusionary laws, being at the bottom of the um, rung, but then also the fact that like blacks came here and found an opportunity to prosper. And so it's not necessarily a good or a bad, it's just what happened. Can you tell me about the um, catalysts of change? Um, I like to think of it as twofold. Um, the first black athlete at Boise Junior College, now is Boise State, was a my, actually my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, Aurelius, otherwise known as Buck Buckner. And this um, panel kind of captures some of the lesser known facts of Idaho, such as Pocatello was once upon a time like this microcosm of a melting pot as far as the nation, but in Pocatello, Idaho. And it wasn't just as simple as black and white. You had blacks, you had Filipinos, you had Italians, you had a very large immigrant section living in Pocatello, Idaho. It's called the Iron Triangle. Um, I gave a speech there a couple of years ago. I mentioned that and people thought I was crazy because nobody was aware of that history. Pocatello, when it was a, um, a locomotive city, had a very diverse population and they were quite you know, forward thinking as far as social change. And then also with the um, 
fights for civil rights. My grandmother worked on the commission to pass a civil rights law in Idaho three years before the feds. So we often miss that, that no, Idaho has always been conducive to a variety of people, even doing so, such as passing a civil rights law, which is antithetical to the narrative. People always think we're somehow synonymous with Jim Crow South when we didn't have that here. I think it's probably because people have heard so many stories about the Aryan Nation and other white supremacist groups up north. True. That they put the blanket on the history perhaps of Idaho. What do you think? And my, my beef with that is twofold. Um, number one, the Idahoans put out the Aryans. Uh, number two, he wasn't from Idaho, he was from Colorado. He's a retired Colorado, uh, Colorado engineer who chose to buy land there and they said this is going to be the, you know, the forefront of the Aryan nations. We shouldn't catch the, uh, the problem for that. It's not like we said, hey, please come here and start this here. And at the same time, when they were pushed out 20 years ago, nobody's told that story, that they were pushed out by the Idahoans, as opposed to this notion of the, oh, they were welcomed by the Idahoans and somehow protected. It, it, it wasn't that. And so I think we've got to retake our narrative, tell people what it is, as opposed to allowing other people to speak so ill of us. Yes, we're a little more traditional than most, but I don't know that how tradition has anything to do with um, racism or bigotry. I mean, we can be very traditional and very Idaho, and that's not anti-other. What's this panel about, Philip? Uh, Reverend Dr. Mamie Oliver, who was actually the first tenured professor at Boise State University, and she was also the wife of the preacher that I grew up with as a child when this building was actually still serving as a church. Um, her husband, Dr. Reverend Oliver, um, was my preacher as a child. And um, this shows her struggle since arriving in Idaho, I shouldn't say struggle, but she's one of the most important people as far as really capturing, encapsulating, and then documenting the history of blacks in Idaho. She did a book called um, Idaho Ebony, which is the first kind of collection of the history of blacks in Idaho, what we've done, how we got here, you know, what awaited us, etc. And um, she's done social work. She's currently a preacher of a church. She's a wonderful woman. This is a big year. 20th anniversary of the Idaho Black History Museum. Yes, sir. What does that mean to you and the founders of this that, to reach that milestone? I think the biggest thing is just kind of indicative of how um, Boise and Idaho has grown, changed, etc. The fact that we're able to last 20 years, because when they originally had the idea, there was some, um, not misgivings, but some concern about how viable of a, an idea that was. The city of Boise has been remarkable in supporting. They maintain the structure. The, the city of Boise, the people have been overly supportive. You get a wide range of people coming in, whether it be those um, stereotypically liberal or those very conservative. We have, it's, a, it's a beautiful little meeting point where people can talk. And um, that's been a wonderful thing to kind of serve much more a, a common place of civility that we can have these conversations. And um, it's kind of, I think it's very Idaho-esque in the sense that provided we allow ourselves to have these conversations, we can, we can get through this. It doesn't have to be this antipathy or this uh, um, uh, vitriol towards each other. It's like, hey, let, let, let's dial it back a notch. Let's keep it Idaho-centric and figure out, okay, how are we going to get through this? and use our differing perspectives to come to a conclusion as opposed to being, um, I don't know, stuck in this notion of it's my way or it's wrong. That's just, that's asinine, pardon me. Another 20 years at least. Absolutely, unequivocally, I've got, I've got a, a, a about to be nine year old and she's convinced that she's gonna do it all from be in the Senate, uh, run the museum, and gosh knows what's else, so we're in she good has hands. She some great role models. We're, in, we're in good hands, we're in good hands. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you, sir. Thompson says the city of Boise maintains the building, but they rely on donations to keep the doors open. They offer group tours and provide community outreach programs. The Idaho Black History Museum is open Tuesday through Thursday from 10 to 3 and Saturday from 11 to 3. You can check their website for more information. Well, Philip Thompson is carrying on the legacy of his mom who started the museum. You may know her as State Senator Cherie Buckner Webb. She just made a big announcement about her future in the public eye. We'll hear from her later in the show. But first, an organization at Boise State is working to lift up students of many cultures and bring people together. It's Ford Truck Month. And if this is your kind of day, and this is your kind of truck, then this is your month, Ford Truck Month. Now get great deals on the trucks as tough as the people who drive them. 
Now get a 2019 Ford Ranger with $4,000 total cash back. Only at your local Ford stores. The President's Day Super Sale at Furniture Row has been extended, and you don't want to miss it. Shop today and find amazing deals storewide on dining, living, bedroom, and mattresses. And best of all, the more you buy, the more you save. Save a hundred bucks on every thousand you spend. Or score a free patio set when you spend $29.99 or more. Plus, seven years no interest financing. But hurry, the extended President's Day Super Sale at Furniture Row ends soon. It's time to shake things up at breakfast. Sure, you could have the same old, same old, or you could bite into the Chicken McGriddles or the McChicken Biscuit. Get both for just three bucks and add any size coffee for a dollar. You may have seen him on Monday on the Today Show with Hoda and Jenna. Guess what? Corbin Maxey, local wildlife expert, is going to be on our show this Monday morning live. Yeah, he's bringing some of his animal friends with him, and we know you love his animal friends. Not such a big fan of the reptiles and spiders, though. Oh, no. But you've done so much <laughs> <laughs> that little guy just pooped all over the back of my dress. Really, I love Corbin, and we're going to have a lot of fun. We hope. <laughs> Monday on today's Morning News. My favorite thing about my job is being able to talk about science, make it accessible, make it fun. But in the classroom, it's so much different because you actually see eyeballs that light up and you inspire these ideas or maybe a future meteorologist. And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Today we are focusing on Black History Month. Philip Thompson at the Black History Museum talked about bringing people of different backgrounds together to have conversations and promote understanding. Multicultural Student Services at Boise State University has a similar goal, to raise awareness about marginalized and oppressed groups across cultures and promote an environment where people with different values and beliefs are treated with respect and dignity. First year BSU student Mateso Goja works with Multicultural Student Services and is also leading the committee for the university's Black History Month activities. And Mateso also happens to be from Tanzania and has been in Idaho for five years now. Mateso, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I just, you know, I want to start off by talking about Multicultural Student Services. What does the, uh, the group offer students and how does it help them? Uh, so we do um, programming um, for um, both uh, for uh, black people and Latino and Asian, all kind of uh, underrepresented communities uh, here at Boise State. So we we hold we hold training workshops and we provide a space for students who are underrepresented to have conversations about um, different topics and we give each other advice on like resources and all that kind of stuff. And how has the, the organization helped you being part of it and also then you know, working with other people? I think the, the community we have, um, just working with different people from different backgrounds and just uh, learning from uh, different cultures because um, I've learned from African culture, my, my culture, African American culture, Asian, uh, Mexican, like all different cultures and being at this one space that provide all that kind of uh, different learning. And do you believe that that makes people richer inside? Yes, I, I believe that um, understanding other cultures makes people are more um, connected because we see our differences and our similarities and then we see how we can connect with one another because we, if, we don't, if I don't understand you, I'm not just gonna, we, we can't be friends, we can't, we can't work on uh, solving a problem or we can't do anything. Unless you have that conversation. Yes, right. we've got to have the conversation. So as I mentioned, you're heading up the committee for the Black History Month activities at right. Boise State. Um, what kinds of things are you doing and what was the, that you're hoping students and the community get out of those events? I think the, the, just the students coming together and having uh, this amazing experience. We were holding several uh, events on, on this month for Black History Month. We, we had... Um, um, movie screening of the movie 13, the documentary that talk about uh, incarcer mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, we we do some uh, craft and art for just different uh, African culture and African American. We ho we're, we're holding a, a panel discussion this week ab about like the differentiate of like African culture and African American. How does that connect to like Black History Month and all kind of stuff just having a discussion about that and other things. And we were talking off camera a little bit earlier and you, you, you had an interesting quote 
from Dr. King. Yes, so that, that's like, what most of my people would ask me like, why, you're, you're not even African-American, why do you care about, like, our, our black history, I'm like, no, I'm still black. Yes. We might have come, this is what Dr. King said, we might have come from different ships, but we're still in the same boat. So it's best to, to work together, work together cross cultures? And, yes. Now, um, so what are you majoring in? Uh, I'm majoring in uh, business, uh, but you the entrepreneur. Um, I want to start my own company some days. Do you have any idea yet? I know you're just a first year student. Do you have any idea yet which direction you'd like to go? I'm going like uh, online businesses. So uh, e-business? Yes. Uh, I want to... I want to beat Amazon at some point. I want to. I want to do. You want to beat Amazon? <laughs> yeah. Hey, why Maybe. set your why set your goals low, right? You gotta you gotta hit the high. The what's high your, bars. So uh, with that in mind, what's your what's your philosophy about life, you know, and how you approach it? I think life is is like uh, life is a is a, is a learning experience. Uh, we make mistakes and then we get up. We keep going. I think that li the purpose of like life is just a test for, for, for us to you know, grow. Well, I think you're going to grow and go very far. It's been such a pleasure to meet you, Matessa. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming in and Thanks telling you. us all about what's going on at Boise State. Thank Appreciate you for the invitation. It. Well, next, we're going to wrap the edition of Viewpoint focusing on Black History Month up with the latest on a woman who has had a huge impact on Idaho, who has worked to make a difference for a long time. Hear from Senator Cherie Buckner-Webb as she prepares for the next phase of her life. My fellow Americans, I stand before you today humbled because the President's Day sale at Denver Mattress has been extended. Right now, the more you buy, the more you save. Get 100 bucks off every thousand you spend. And check out the Doctor's Choice Plush or Firm, only $599.99. Plus, check out adjustable bases starting as low as $499. And for the budget-minded, get the Summit Queen, only $189.99. Plus, seven years, no interest financing. But hurry, the extended President's Day sale at Denver Mattress ends Thursday. If there's anything you can do for a child, it's allowing them to realize that they have a voice. And with that voice, these first and second graders are inspiring change within their school and their community. These kids inspire me every day. They're speaking out to make the world a better place and people are listening. What I'm doing now is making a huge difference. On the next Innovative Educator, meet a teacher who's empowering these little learners to make a huge impact even at such a young age. Monday on today's Morning News and the News at 4. My twin brother Jacob has an autism spectrum disorder. He didn't have any friends as a result. It broke my heart. That was the inspiration behind my nonprofit score friend. Go! Educating people to include people with differences is so important because when Jacob's included, he feels like he can succeed in life and he feels like he actually has a purpose. Warmest, coldest, driest, wettest. Are these extremes the new norm when it comes to describing our climate? Over the past decade that we are seeing a little bit more, uh, you know, these periods of extremes or setting new records. Making climate forecasting crucial for our road ahead. Meteorologist Bree Eggers breaking down the climate trends in a two-part series, Tuesday and Wednesday on the News at 10 on Idaho's News Channel 7. The First Alert Weather Team, only on Idaho's News Channel 7. Cherie Buckner-Webb made history when she was elected as Idaho's first ever African-American state legislator. This past week, the Assistant House Minority Leader from Boise announced she will not seek re-election in November. She becomes the latest Democratic leader to step away this year. House Minority Leader Matt Erpelding resigned last year to take a job with the Chamber of Commerce, and Caucus Chair Marianne Jordan recently announced she wouldn't run again for her Senate seat. Joe Paris sat down with Senator Buckner Webb to ask why now is the time to step away and if she thinks the Democrats are in a good spot. Well, the big announcement this morning, you're not going to run again. Uh, I know people are asking why. Why don't you want to continue? I have had a, a great role. It's been 10 years and I have never believed that it was a position for life. I know in some legislators and with some legislators also, they want to stay forever. That is not my goal. My goal is to endow the future, to uh, bring along new, younger talent, um, uh, diverse talent. And when I say diverse, I mean from all walks of life. I'm not just talking about age, ethnicity, or, or that kind of thing. I'm talking about really folks that are ready to look to what the future is like. Do you think you accomplished what you set out to do? Um, 
I guess, I guess I, I, I did in a way, and here's what I set out to do. The best work I possibly could for the people of Idaho. I wanted to learn, I wanted to grow, I wanted to bring a diverse opinion, I wanted to uh, change a few things, not everything got accomplished that I wished it did, and maybe now it's time for me to try to work it from outside this body instead of another. For the people that will be in this building still, yes, yes. you won't be here, Senator Jordan won't be here, Representative Erpelding gone. People are curious what's going on with the Democrats. Are you guys going to be lost without the names that have been here for the last five years? Well, no, because we've been growing. Uh, we've been growing. What did they say in, in football or basketball? We've got a, we've got another team. We've got another team coming in. There are folks that are eager, willing, and capable, already preparing themselves to take our places. Anybody that thinks that they can't leave an organization and that it'll fall apart is arrogant and foolish. There's still time in this session, but is there anything that you feel like will be left on the table for you that you wish you would have gotten done? It didn't get done during your time here, and you're hopeful that in the future someone else is able to push it. Well, forward. I haven't given up yet, but one of the things that's most, most, most invaluable to me would be um, amending the Human Rights Act to include uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. If we continue to differentiate or discriminate against one group, we're discriminating against all of us. We haven't done our work. That's unfortunate to me. What message do you have to the state of Idaho as you, I guess, not retire, but as you leave this job? There's still a great work to do, and particularly if you're talking about the state of Idaho in this body, we, we have work to do. We cannot lose our focus on what is right. Uh, politics kind of get jammed up in it sometimes. We've got to get past politics and get to human beings and the impact to those human beings. Our cities, our counties, we need to work collaboratively, stay in our own lane as we're supposed to, but to be engaged, fully engaged, the head and the heart thing to make it work out. Well, this past week, Senator Buckner Webb proposed a bill in the Senate Transportation Committee for a specialty license plate that says, too great for hate. She said it would show Idahoans are inclusive. If Senate Bill 1297 passes, proceeds from the license plate would go toward the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights. That's home of the Idaho and Frank Human Rights Memorial. So what's next for Sheree Buckner Webb? She tells us she has plenty of ideas in the works. She will not be disappearing, though. She plans to continue to be a part of Idaho politics, but in a much different way. Guess we'll have to stay tuned to see what she does. That is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.